Hello everyone, welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4, the legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal, Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On today's edition of Ralph Reads, I bring forth the fourth installment brought to you by the fourth horseman. Reintroducing Jan 11 and a masterpiece he penned, Angel Light, Body of Persons Empowered. Why go audible when it's my voice that's most recordable? Allow me to show all you. Let the reading commence. Part 2, Chapter 22 The Hamptons, a group of villages and hamlets that together comprise the South Fork of Long Island. Not only a historic summer colony, but one of the top five most popular seaside resorts of the Northeast. Facing the Atlantic Ocean, this wealthy community can get as live as Manhattan nightclubs with social gatherings and wild parties thrown in these lavished homes. And in the daytime, social activity was just as high. Sports cars ripped through the asphalt, beaches crowded with heavenly bodies, and tanning salons became as busy as after-school study groups. Further inland stood an extravagant collection of modeled mansions occupied by some of the richest people in the country. One of those people happened to be Crispin Pagnucci, the last mafia figure left standing in the tri-state area. At 24 years old, Crispin started his career as a hitman for his father and former mob boss, Peter Pagnucci. Years later, he recruited hungry and desperate street thugs and started enterprising in the racketeering game, becoming a huge name overnight. He inherited the helm of the Pagnucci family at 35 years old after his father had died of lung cancer. After merging his crew with the rest of the family, Crispin instantly had one of the most powerful mafias on the East Coast. However, being on top for so long made him lazy. His weight grew as much as his wealth. With potential rivals too old or coked up to make smart decisions, the mafia kingpin sought no need to hustle anymore. He now spends his days going to expensive restaurants for lunch, flirting with foreign women hired to maintain his household, and remotely set operations to keep a stranglehold on the competition. Driver Avenue is usually off-limits to visitors and tourists alike unless properly escorted by current residents, a rule implemented by Pagnucci Security. But this night, however, was a different story. A black Honda Accord crept down the deserted and noiseless street and stopped on the corner of 16th Street directly across from Pagnucci's six-car garage fortress. Zeke Tricolo sat behind the wheel, running his fingers through his dirty blonde surfer hair while feeling an uneasiness roll inside his stomach. His blue eyes kept shifting back and forth from his wedding band and the dark road ahead. Riding shotgun, wearing commando face paint, was an insane Australian renegade named Rusty Pipes. Smiling like a madman on Halloween, Rusty signaled for the four men squished in the back seat to check their weapons. 
All of the men were dressed in black and packed with enough artillery to ambush a small village. You okay, mate? He asked after tapping Zeke on the shoulder. I'm fine, Zeke responded, looking away. I just want to get this damn thing over with. Check in with Harvey and make sure his unit is in position. And if they're not, I'll cut their sticking throats out and crochet it on my vest. Sound good, Zeke? Whatever you say, Russ. Meanwhile, a black van pulled up to the back of Pagnucci's mansion, carrying nine more armed and uninvited guests, fully equipped with a mobile computer system. Sitting behind the screen and tapping away on the keyboard was Harvey Gaines, bald, dark as coffee grounds, and six foot seven inches of pure muscle. I'm in, he said, hacking into Lipa's energy grid database. Surfing through the energy supply accounts, he found the grids registered to the Pagnucci mansion. Two grids? Examining the virtual grid map, Harvey discovered that Crispin Pagnucci had two generators registered to his home, one of them strictly to operate his defense system. Multicolored sticky notes decorated the sides of the screen, each displaying different override codes. He rolled a cursor down and clicked on the button marked off. A question box popped up on the screen. Are you sure you want to shut this grid off? He slid the cursor over to the yes box and clicked it. Red bleeps from the surveillance cameras faded to black. Alarm circuits went dead. Electricity stopped pulsing through the towering entrance gates. The house was completely defenseless. Rusty felt his smartphone vibrate against his leg. He took it out from the pocket of his camo pants and read a text message from Harvey. Grid is down. He immediately grabbed his automatic weapon and said to the backseat crew, Okay, girlies. Remember your assigned stations. Let's move. Scurrying out of the car, Rusty and the intruders raced across the street and climbed over the towering mansion gate. Completely undetected, they stayed low while running onto the mansion grounds. Zeke remained in the car, wishing he was still in bed with his wife, Naomi. He fell back in the driver's seat and said, End this, please. While the invaders planted explosives at specific areas around the mansion, Rusty hid behind a massive water fountain in the middle of the courtyard and aimed his weapons at the front doors. We're in position, he said into his earpiece. Your turn. Around back, the first person to step out of the van was Rocky Diamonds, a sultry woman with mesmerizing green eyes. The complexion of a dune and covered from head to toe in leather. Sneaking in through the backyard, she took cover behind some bushes and got a clear view of Crispin's crew enjoying themselves with indoor activity. Sharply dressed men gambling in the first floor lounge. A few others drinking and smoking on the balcony, and the head of mansion security, Sammy Constantino, sat inside an outdoor jacuzzi, snuggling up with two housekeepers. Rocky dug into her duffel bag and scooped up a handful of darts. Under the needle points were small green beads filled with a poisonous liquid. Quantity may be small, but still strong enough to kill a lion with one poke. She then laid out several mechanical pieces by her feet and started connecting them like Lego blocks. Once the clicking and cocking were done, a British sniper rifle had been built. Darts were loaded into a cartridge and then chambered to her weapon. She rested a bus stock against her shoulder while planting her sexy green eye against the four 12 by 4 rifle scope, able to spot targets from a hundred yards away. 
Sammy was first on her list. Silently, she fired three darts. A second later, Sammy and his lady slumped down into the water. She then proceeded to fire darts at the rest of the party. Gangsters fell like dominoes, having no idea death would come for them so suddenly and quietly. Making his rounds around the mansion was Johnny, Pagnucci's bookkeeper, a timid bookworm with a thick mustache, shaggy black hair, and circular framed glasses. Besides being Crispin's lackey, Johnny's main job was to keep the money fluctuating for the family. Kitchen, living room, dining room, and guest rooms were all clear, but he knew not to go up to the top floor. Crispin was currently conducting personal business with two Swedish women looking to fill new in-house positions as head chefs. Johnny checked the second floor and noticed it was unusually quiet. No songs played from the jukebox. No hollering from guys losing their money. No smoke fogging up the hallways. Walking into the lounge, Johnny nearly fainted at the sight of Crispin's men lying on the floor with rolled back eyes and green spider webs on their necks. Just then, from the balcony doors, he spotted shadowy figures scattering across the yard. He ran down the hall and pushed the alarm button, but no siren sounded. He ran to the security room and saw blank camera screens across the wall. Going against orders, Johnny ran to the top floor and banged on the boss's bedroom door, hearing loud squeaks and exaggerated moaning. He banged louder and yelled that the mansion was under attack. Out came a fuming Crispin Pagnucci, wearing a tiger-printed silk robe that barely covered his large belly. What the hell's the matter with you? Crispin barked through his grinding teeth. Didn't I tell you not to come up here? Eh? Huh? I'm not done getting my exercise for- Boss, we're under attack, interrupted Johnny. Sammy and some others are dead, and so are the alarms. Crispin slammed the door behind him and raced down the hall, shoving Johnny out of the way. That's impossible, he denied, tying up his robe and pushing back his hair. Who the hell's got the balls to attack me in my own home? Look outside and see for yourself. Just then, gunshots rang throughout the property. Crispin ran back to the bedroom while a panicked Johnny hid behind the floor sculpture. A couple of perpetrators raced up the stairs yelling like suicidal terrorists. Dramatically, Crispin stormed down the hall firing a Beretta ARX-160 assault rifle. Blood splattered on his soft white walls as the invaders got buried with a swarm of bullets tearing right through their armored commando uniforms. Crispin yanked Johnny up by his collar and handed him a twenty-two handgun. They rushed downstairs to the lobby and met up with the remainder of the Pagnucci crew, who already gathering weaponry from the armory closet behind the fireplace. Split up! He shouted. I want all intruders killed on sight! You hear me? Anyone not wearing a goddamn tailored suit better be dead on this floor when I get back! None of them are to get out of here alive! I WANT THEM ALL DEAD! Back outside, Rusty had a pair of headphones planted on ears, bopping his head to the classic hip-hop song from the group Gangstar, Gotta Get Over. The front doors flew open, and several armed gangsters ran out to the courtyard. Rusty shoved the headphones into his pocket and readied his weapon. As soon as the crew stepped out to the solar lighting, Rusty opened fire. 
One by one, gangsters drop like flies. They tried retaliating, but the flowing water from the fountain provided the perfect cover for Rusty and his malicious sneak attack. Surviving gangsters were dumbfounded. Quivered jaws wondered where this parade of bullets came from. Who's doing that? One of them nervously asked. Who's shooting at us? Once the smoke cleared, Rusty stood on top of the water fountain like a Las Vegas headliner and shouted, Guess who? Unmercifully, he opened fire. Blinded by sparks and smoke, the gangsters were massacred to a bloody mess. Chapter 23 Crispin and Johnny raced to the living room and took cover behind the bar. More intruders came shooting through the windows. The boss retaliated with a monstrous spray of bullets, easily rattling and dropping them on the waxed floor like touching an electric fence. Crispin dragged Johnny by the arm and rushed him to the dining hall, hiding underneath a long Chippendale table. Johnny shook like a leaf, letting out a slight whimper. Crispin held up his fist, motioning for him to shut his mouth. Just then, they spotted two pairs of legs stepping across the wooden floor, walking closer to the table. By the look of their creased and dirty boots, Crispin knew these guys weren't his. He slowly raised his machine gun while Johnny curled up like a child covering his ears. A sudden rattle of bullets from the front of the palace led the intruders back out to the hallway. Seeing that the coast was clear, Crispin rolled out from under the table and dragged Johnny toward the kitchen. We can get out through the employee entrance, he hollered. Remember to shoot anyone who gets in your face. I don't give a damn who it is. Now move. We can't leave yet, boss, Johnny hollered back. Who's to say they won't chase after us? We gotta stay and make sure they're all eliminated. Are you crazy? Why do you think I hired all those goons for? To do my fighting for me. Now get in that damn kitchen. Go. Go. Hurry up. Move. They're tearing the mansion apart, boss. It's only a matter of time before they take everything you own. What are you talking about? Johnny peeked down the hall and saw the intruders flipping over furniture and taking down paintings. Look at them, he said, waving for his boss to witness their actions. They're not just here to kill us. They're looking for something. For the first time tonight, Crispin panicked. His mansion was loaded with expensive goodies, but none of it has been taken. There's only one thing these guys are searching for. And for him to let these low-down crooks get their grubby mitts on his fortune is worse than death itself. Even if the U.S. Army had bombed the mansion, his money would never be found. But how could these invaders have known it was here? There must be a mole in this crew. How else would they know to catch him off guard by attacking him at home? Could they be with the South Americans or Colombians seeking revenge for being cut out of the drug trade? Crispin crawled into the kitchen and caressed the back of a china closet searching for a hidden trigger. Get ready to move this thing when I say, he said to Johnny. After minutes of fumbling back there, he found the switch. As he flipped it up, a secret door had opened. Crispin and Johnny moved the china closet away from the wall with just enough room to crawl through the secret opening. 
Below the narrow crawled space was a downward staircase. Johnny heard fading gunshots as he trotted down, feeling sorrow for the guys losing their lives to keep their greedy boss safe. Leaping off the final step, the gangsters wound up in an underground level that was larger than his living room, walls completely coated with bank vault steel. There were steel bars at the far end that stretched from the floor to the ceiling. Behind them was a vault door, double the size of a normal opening. Wait here, keep a lookout, Crispin whispered. He pulled out a set of keys from a compartment disguised as a fuse box. After unlocking the bars, he punched a key code into the number pad just above the mechanical dial on the vault door. A green light shined. He spun the dial and pulled open the door with all of his might. Johnny's eyes bulged with amazement. Safety deposit boxes lined up against the walls and touched every corner of the vault. Run to the first room down the hall and bring me a cart, Crispin ordered. Then start stacking as many boxes as you can. Johnny didn't move. Well? Why are you standing there like you're lost? Get moving. I gotta get to my cases out from the floor safe. What cases? asked Johnny. Just do what I say, damn it. Crispin turned a black handle on the floor of the vault and opened the bottom safe. Three black-coated cases were stacked on the top of each other. Trusting greed over logic, the boss opened the top case filled to the edge with bearer bonds. Millions inside one case alone. How the hell are we going to get this loot out of here undetected? Asked Johnny, rushing back with a cart. There's no way we can carry these cases up that narrow staircase. And you want to empty the money boxes too? It's only a matter of time before those lunatics come down here and cut our heads off. I ain't leaving without my money, you pencil neck. If you want to run, then be prepared to run forever. From them and me. But just to put your chicken-hearted self at ease, May I remind you that I'm the boss for a reason. There's a passageway behind the stairs that leads to an armored truck, which happens to be parked in a private lot at the back of the house. Satisfied now? So can you shut up and get to work? Forgive me, boss, Johnny apologized. I should have known you had a backup plan. That's why I'm the brains of this damn outfit. Yes, sir. Except there's one minor detail you seem to have overlooked. What the hell are you mumbling about? You still don't know who's behind this. Two slugs popped out from the twenty-two in Johnny's hand. Red liquid leaked from the quarter-sized holes left in Crispin's pudgy chest. His breathing escalated as he collapsed, clutching his chest and gasping for air. Wearing an arrogant grin, Johnny kneeled next to his dying boss. Kill me, whispered Crispin, coughing up blood. You better kill me, because I swear, if I get out of here, you're a dead man. You lousy rat scum. I'll p p put your balls on a string. I'll use your head as a damn a ashtray. Are you done? Asked Johnny. Tossing away his glasses, he peeled off his thick mustache and tore the shaggy wig from off his scalp. He wildly rubbed his wavy black hair and showed off his cleanly shaven handsome face. First off, 
No one from this ridiculous organization will be left alive after tonight. He pulled out his wallet and showed a New York State Police Department badge stapled inside engraved Detective John Hart. Even if a few of them slipped through the cracks, no one would ever believe the NYPD would be capable of committing such a horrific act. Besides, I'll find someone else to take the fall for this, like I've done so many times already. Crispin couldn't believe that his right-hand man of so many years had betrayed him. John's grin stretched into a sinister smile as he watched Pagnucci grow weaker. There was no one left to help him. I've destroyed every cartel you've been at war with, and those numbskulls in City Hall still haven't got a clue that it was me all along. And now, it's your turn to perish. It took a while for me to gather enough intel on you. But the one thing that baffled me all these years was where the hell did you keep your money? And here we are. Thank you for sharing your secret with me, boss. Deafening bangs echoed through the basement as John fired a few more bullets into Crispin's skull, finishing the job. He then dragged the dead body out of the vault and kicked it over to the corner. Gazing at the numerous money boxes, he wondered, How fast can I snatch out all the money before the cops show up? Closing his eyes and turning up his palms, John began speaking in tongue, summoning an unearthly spirit. Suddenly, winds rushed through the corridor. His eyes turned into blinding white pupils, and in a matter of seconds, he swooped through the vault like a tornado and emptied out all of the money boxes, stacking cash, jewelry, and bonds by the staircase. Shortly after, Rusty and Rocky came skipping down the stairway. All the bugs have been exterminated, snickered Rusty. John grabbed his cell and dialed Zeke. Drive around the back of the mansion, he said. We found Lucky's pot of gold. He then faced Rusty and Rocky. Get the rest of the team down here and grab every ounce of loot down to the last Indian head penny. Got it? Load them in the duffels and follow the path behind the stairs. And take it where, big boy? Asked Rocky. Old Bubbleguts has an armored truck at the end of the tunnel. It seems he was good for something after all. Now let's move before Long Island's dumbest show up. Rusty and Rocky barked at the grunts to hurry up, packing the loot as fast as possible. Meanwhile, John walked down the secret trail and found the armored truck covered in black tarp and parked in the middle of the secret lot. Like contestants in a shopping spree, the crew banged into each other as they raced to get to the lot first. Dozens of duffel bags got loaded in the back of the truck. Rusty jumped behind the steering wheel and started the engine, warning everyone to stand clear. He floored the gas and busted through the wooden boards used to disguise the entrance ramp. Dead gangsters got crushed under the truck's massive wheels as Rusty drove onto the mansion lawn and off the property. Rocky led the rest of the team back to the van. Harvey then backed the van out to the street and peeled off following the armored truck. John was the last to leave the mansion, admiring his masterpiece of violence. Zeke waited inside the Accord, which was parked by the rear gates. Are the charges operational? asked John as he ran to the car. I got it covered, Zeke responded as he showed him the detonator. But is this necessary? You said they never catch us. And they won't. But even the greatest plans need some insurance. This has to look like an ambush, not a robbery. 
and you know better than to question my orders. Now do it. Zeke gulped his throat and pressed a button. Explosions puffed through the entire foundation. Balls of fire lit up the sky. Marble and concrete erupted into gray smoke, clouding the entire block in chalky dust. Zeke hit the gas and drove away while John reclined back in the passenger seat. Just one more piece of the puzzle left, said John while lighting a cigar. Then our plan can begin. Chapter 24 Ward's Island is a forgotten attraction amongst the plethora of iconic landmarks in New York City. Only a bridge crossing from Manhattan, this island of a park is the perfect place for family gatherings and outdoor activities such as baseball fields, running tracks, occasional concert venues, and miles of vibrant green grass and barbecues and bike riding. What's also perfect, it's secluded location. The sole reason why the New York State Police Department has made this area their base of operations. Pulling into the parking lot was Detective John Hart, yawning and rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Moving stolen money all night would knock the wind out of the toughest crooks. However, John and his posse kept their eyes on the grand prize, which is why they continue to play this sadistic game of cat and mouse. Though in his late thirties, John's energetic attitude and properly groomed appearance made him look younger, especially with his pushed-back Elvis hairstyle. Over the years, John had gone through a major transformation. Back at the police academy, he was never the sharpest knife in the drawer. However, his charisma has bailed him out of several jams. Although his efforts with the city hall protest crashed and burned, as Gina predicted, certain individuals took notice of his enthusiasm and determination. John was promised unlimited power in exchange for his services to take down all threats to their organization, known as the Clusifix. Naturally, John accepted. Remarkably thereafter, John breezed through the law enforcement ranks, going from patrol officer to detective within a few years. His new powers also blossomed over time. Speed and strength were one thing, but mind control was his strongest attribute. Unattractive to the females in his department, but his manipulation makes them gawk at him as if he was Brad Pitt. Zeke Tricolo became his right-hand man after the protest. While on duty, they would harass drug dealers to either pocket their profits or arrest them to fill their monthly quota. He also planned tactical operations to cripple large crime syndicates such as heists and full-scale assaults. It took about five years, but all forces that posed a threat to them had been eliminated. Crispin Pagnucci was the last man standing. And now, with the police force locked down under his watchful eye, John Hart will be unstoppable. Gossip circulated throughout as John entered the department lobby. Eyes were glued to every television as Channel 4 News anchorwoman Trisha White reported live from the fiery scene in Long Island. In the background, Pagnucci's mansion looked like a suburban wasteland. Firefighters tamed the last of the flames, while the withered lawn was cluttered with coroner vans. Residents lined up outside the gates to take pictures and throw questions at anyone who would listen. John was pleased with his latest handiwork. Of all the mafias that crumbled under his fist, this one was his greatest victory to date.
It was his reward for the years of patience he endured while posing as Crispin's lackey. He would have loved to have used his powers to make Crispin bark like a dog in front of his crew before blowing his brains out. But John had been warned many times to conserve his powers for stronger adversaries. Fellow detective Anthony LaPark passed John in the lobby and patted him on the shoulder. Davis is looking for you and he's not too happy, said LaPark. Did he say why? asked John. Nah, but I do know he got dragged into an emergency meeting with the mayor over this Pagnucci crap. Don't know why everyone is up in arms about this nonsense. One less scumbag to deal with if you ask me. And I agree. This is what drives me crazy about that stupid mayor. Someone out there did the dirty work for us and he's pissed off about it. Why? Hadn't it occurred to him that rival organizations wanted Pagnucci gone as much as we did? These political tightwads are all the same. Nothing works for them unless they benefit from it. I hear you, man. Hopefully whatever crew did this will pay a visit to City Hall. Anthony leaned closer to John's ear. You didn't hear that from me. Of course not, John winked. John left the lobby and walked down to the hall to Davis's office. He needed time to think. Realizing propaganda around this incident is spreading like wildfire. He needed to find a cork big enough to plug up this hole and fast. He mentioned in the vault that someone else would take the fall, but he was so focused on the money that he never planned that far ahead. John arrived at the office and saw the door was closed. Could Davis be on the phone call? He tapped onto the glass but got no answer. Slowly, he opened the door. Empty. Perfect. He can now sit down and ponder on how to bring this episode to a close. Who can he pin this tragedy on? A drug cartel would be too obvious. Besides, any random department could run their investigation. He needed a decoy. Someone willing to take the blame. No criminal in their right mind would want this pinned on their resume. Who's left? It had to be unsuspected, undetected, and unexpected. Saxon Davis stormed into the office and plopped his stressed body onto the chair. After Gina's departure, his love for the business had diminished. It was now just a job, a means to get paid. Sorrow and guilt dragged him down further after the sudden death of his wife, Beverly, three years ago. His 67-year-old body was wearing thin. Motivating him now was counting the days to retirement. Commissioner Wood made good on his promise that Saxon was now the deputy superintendent for the state police. Months after taking the job, Saxon recruited John Hart and six other rookies to start an experimental undercover detectives unit. Noticing John's remarkable arrest record magically reappearing overnight, Saxon offered to take him under his wing, hoping to mold him into a great officer as he did for Gina. Their bond grew into a father-son type relationship, at least in the veteran's eyes. John, however, manipulated that entire situation, playing on Saxon's broken emotions and the need for companionship. In doing so, John had gotten the freedom to further the advancement of his diabolical plan. Seeing his boss silent in his chair for several minutes, John put on a false face of concern. Saxon just had an emergency meeting with Commissioner Wood, Superintendent Robert Teasley, and Mayor Miles Goldberg via speakerphone. Despite concern for public safety, Goldberg's top priority was to prevent wealthy residents from relocating to California in fear that their lavished homes may be next. Saxon hoped to never converse with Goldberg again. 
However, this violent onslaught is close to being called a state of emergency. So the mayor wanted all of the city's top officials involved. Where the hell have you been? A stressed Saxon asked John. I've been looking for you everywhere. I got here at nine, explained John. Excuse my appearance, sir. If you want me to change, I can. It's only 9 a.m.? My apologies, son. I'm getting too old for this job. Things are getting me, you know... Saxon rubbed his temples as if he felt stabbing needles. City Hall is freaking out over this Pagnucci assassination. Goldberg's coming down on us after receiving word about our undercover operation, thinking we should have prepared for this somehow. Prepared? Can that dumb jackass tell me how to hell? Can we prepare for the invasion of one crew while investigating another crew? You can't, sir. Goldberg must have left his brains in the toilet again. I don't see how the city got hoodwinked in voting for that jackass again. Come to think of it, Johnny, where the hell was you? Being under with the Pagnucci family all these years, I thought you'd be the first person not hear from. You didn't give us the heads up once the gunfire started. Not even a text. We could have sent back up and salvaged what was left of this operation. Sir, I was just as shocked as you were. Never in a million years did I think Crispin Bagnucci would get ambushed on his turf. Have any reports come in as to how this unimaginable act transpired? Wait a minute. Am I hearing you right? You were the only cop on the premises, and when something like this goes down, you're nowhere to be found? What the f**k's the matter with you, John? I can't believe I'm hearing this. In an event of this magnitude, I expect my best officer to be on the scene, especially when he was put there, to report all kinds of catastrophes. Like this! We've been building this case for months, and now we got nothing. Did you at least get a whiff of the shooter's cologne? John smirked as he sat up to gather his thoughts. Okay, sir. I want you to listen to me very carefully. And just like that, Saxon mindlessly stared into space as the detective spoke in a slow, mesmerizing tone. I was the one who set up the assassination, John coldly admitted. I shot that greedy whale in the heart and robbed him for every penny he had. And not one cop in this city, including you, the great Saxon Davis, will ever figure that out. However, this is the story you're going to remember. Pagnucci told me to drive his girlfriends to a Kennedy airport, and the traffic was horrendous. The mansion was swarmed with cops and firemen by the time I got back. Therefore, I hightailed it out of there to avoid backlash against the state police for their involvement or lack thereof. Saxon's hypnotized gaze softened. I see, he said, burying his face in his palms. But this puts us back to square one. The mansion was totaled and we have no leads to follow. Did you think I would have suffered in that house for such a long time without gathering any intel on Pagnucci's rivals? I just need some time to investigate without Teasley and Goldberg breathing down my neck. Let me pick my team and I assure you, I'll find the culprits as soon as possible. With no other strategies planned, Saxon leaned forward and tapped his thumbs together. Okay, Hart, he said. I'll let Teasley know that we're looking at a few leads and we'll have answers by the end of the week. You've been on the hot streak up to this point, Johnny. Don't screw this up. Relax. I'll have those guys behind bars before you know it. After his meeting, John walked out to the parking lot and climbed into his car, not wanting his business to be overheard. 
He pulled out a cell phone and dialed his real superior, the one who recruited and graced him with supernatural abilities. Hi, Grandpa, said John. The man wasn't John's grandfather, but for unknown reasons, that was the name he gave. Not even John knows his real identity. John boy, said Grandpa. Did they go for it? Hook, line, and sinker. Grandpa mischievously guffawed. I swear, the stupidity of man doesn't surprise me anymore. Those losers at City Hall are so desperate to have everything added to them that they can't see their empire crumbling from beneath their feet. I can't wait to see those bums fall, then have them lick the dirt off my shoes as an act for me to spare their lives once we own this stinking city. I'm glad you're pleased with the news, sir. Did it take a long time? Remember exercising your powers are necessary, but you shouldn't use them for petty things like this. Davis is an emotional wreck. He'd believe the sky was falling if you told him. You need to start using your gifts to reel in the big fish. I know, sir, but it didn't take much. I used just enough to have him believe that my plan's legit. Your people know what they have to do, right? Not yet, but I will brief them today. They'll be ready. They sure as hell better be. Because if any of them should screw up, make sure you take those dogs behind the barn and put them to sleep understand? Yes, I do. Good. Chapter 25 Cruising down the West Hot Highway, John contemplated on how to write the final chapter in the Crispin Pagnucci story. Brainstorming for ideas, he recalled the morning news reports and searched for loopholes that he could exploit. Officers, both men and women, applauded his efforts, putting the head of organized crime six feet under. And then, a plan had taken shape, and he knew the perfect guys to bring it all together. First, John got on his cell and dialed Zeke. Gather the team for a meeting at the club within the hour, he ordered. I know how we could put this issue to bed once and for all. Why? Laying Pagnucci in the coffin isn't good enough for you? Zeke snapped back. Actually, no. Sooner or later, somebody's gonna be sniffing their nose into our business and just might figure out how we were able to pull off what we've done. I can't take that risk. So just do what I told you and hit me back when it's done. Next, John contacted Rocky Diamonds. Hey, baby girl, he flirted. I need you to dig up every bit of information you can on the 14th precinct. Rosters, profile history, building schematics, shift schedules, etc. You're not thinking of asking these clowns to join us, are you? She asked in disgust. Are you crazy, Rock? John answered. You know me better than that. The enema for law enforcement would stick the tube right in the middle of that hellhole in lower Manhattan. However, let's just say that they're going to finally prove their usefulness. The 14th Precinct was ranked last in the NYPD rating system, having the lowest scores in public safety, community relations, and arrest records. They did, however, reach staggering numbers in corruption and police brutality. Morning shift cops are lazy and night shift cops are sleazy. Internal affairs have been salivating for one wrongful incident to shut them down completely. John then called a public broadcast station and stated that a drug bust was going down in the precinct sometime today. This is unprecedented, he sold to the amateur reporters. Imagine the number of subscribers and likes your network will get. They completely bought in. And lastly, he dialed 14th Precinct Captain Carl Randall. Adding some extra twang in his voice, John pretended to be an interviewer from Police Magazine. 
we've been searching for an officer to write a Pulitzer article on. And guess what, pal? Your name came up on our computer. Thinking this article would lead to stardom, Randall was more than happy to comply. As he babbled on about his childhood, John's voice switched to his infamous mesmerizing tone and gave Randall explicit instructions. Listen to me very carefully. The captain froze in place. Later today, I'll be coming with the state police to raid your precinct and you're going to voluntarily surrender. Repeat these phrases out to the public. We're busted. I shouldn't have done it. We killed them all. Then in the interrogation room, you're going to confess to committing a whole bunch of ludicrous crimes, especially killing Crispin Pagnucci. Do you understand me? Yes, Randall answered in monotone. Thirty minutes later, John drove through the narrow streets by the waterfront of Lower Manhattan, known as the Club District, home of New York's hottest night spots. Every weekend, these clubs will be crammed with college kids to middle-aged partygoers, all looking to get drunk or laid. He drove up to a four-story establishment named Club Candy Cane, the reigning night spot champion of the district an afternoon strip bar that turned into a dance club at night. Huge pink and striped awning hovered over the windows and entrance doors. Black brick walls sealed in the hammering music. Unbeknown to the public eye, the club was merely a masquerade, serving as a hideout for rogue cops of the Clusifix. Aiding with the success of their many underhanded deals, and John had been given complete ownership of this building. A security guard held open the employee entrance door like a hotel doorman as his boss approached. John patted him on the shoulder and walked inside. He got into his private elevator and rode it up to the second floor. The doors opened to a dark gray hallway and several red doors with gold-colored knobs. At the end of the hall was the conference room. Random cops sat and stood around the room, eagerly awaiting the details of their next operation. Rocky, Rusty, Harvey, and Zeke, all present and accounted for. Before starting the meeting, John wanted to talk privately with Zeke, who looked less enthused than the rest of the team. Good job in getting the team here so fast, said John. Not everyone's here, said Zeke. A couple of our guys stationed in the Bronx have their cell phones off and I can't get a hold of them. They're foot soldiers, clowns. What's important is that you and Rocky are here. We don't have a lot of time for the formalities, so we have to plan this operation fast. What plan? What are you talking about? Just a slight hiccup, but nothing we can't fix. With what? Another raid? Come on, John. This whole thing is getting out of control. That's what you say. But since we've started this movement, everything has been in complete control. We knew there'd be some risks involved, but the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow makes it all worthwhile. We're so close to the finish line, Zeke. Don't crack under the pressure now. I've never cracked in my life, John. But just hear me out for a second, okay? I know this is about getting back at Goldberg for putting us in this predicament in the first place. But we are still police officers. Our job is to follow the law and rehabilitate criminals. Not to just kill them off for breaking the law. Our badge still means something. You're right, Zeke. It means we have permission to kick the crap out of anybody we choose whenever we choose. It also stands for how hard we've worked to keep the city safe. For changes to happen, we need to make a sudden impact. It's cruel and it's brutal, but it's necessary. This is the only way those morons in City Hall will listen. 
The look on Zeke's face read that he's had enough of this criminal lifestyle. Sensing his friend's dissension, John changed his dictator tone and tapped into his friend's sensitive side. I know how much you want to settle down with Naomi and live the beaver cleaver lifestyle. If we see this plan now to the very end, then you'll be living like the Kardashians when this is all over. You'll never have to patrol another street again. Isn't that what you want? That's what I want. That's what every cop in that conference room wants. And I plan to give it to them. But I can't pull this off without you. John seems sincere about making a difference, although his actions are definitely vile. Perhaps terroristic. The thought of having an insecure future struck a chord with Zeke. Should he let these years of riding dirty just go away without having anything to show for it? These guys have been rolling together since day one. Why would he want to walk away now? All right, Zeke sighed. Let's get the meeting started. Sure thing, officer, said John, stepping aside for his right-hand man to pass. As Zeke stepped back into the conference room, Rusty Pipes came out and asked John if everything was okay. This was a close call, John responded. We need to be airtight about our operations going forward. Zeke's not buying our story anymore. Keep a close watch on him. No worries, mate, Rusty responded. Rocky Diamond's curvy navy leather wrap body strutted towards the table while thumbing through a stack of papers cradled against her chest. She winked at John while laying the stack on top of the table. It was the information he requested earlier. John approached his team like a general to his soldiers. Listen up, people. I'm going to make this short and sweet because we're pressed for time. Those bums in City Hall demand action. Wanting resolution over our victory last night. Therefore, I say it's showtime. Indistinct chatter surrounded the room. John raised his hands to silence them before continuing. Now a lot more people will have to die sooner than planned. Not that I care about such a thing, but it's what's best for business. Therefore, someone else will have to take the fall for last night's raid, and it's going to be the 14th Precinct. What? Harvey protested. Man, how the hell are we are supposed to take down an entire damn precinct in a matter of hours? A firefight in Manhattan sure as hell ain't good for business, dog. Relax, Harvey. Thanks to the beautiful Miss Diamonds, we have all the intel needed to make this operation successful. According to Internal Affairs, the 14th Precinct is on the verge of being closed down. How many of those cops have already been suspected for police brutality? How many more are speculated and taken bribes? Let's not forget the open cases against them for sexual harassment on local schoolgirls. Cops nodded in agreement, murmured over their distasteful behavior. They're getting overzealous, sticking their noses in our territories, shaking down the drug dealers who I get my profits from. Hell no! If those cops run the streets, then we got no dealers. No dealers means no product. No product means no money. And I love getting my money, ladies and gentlemen. I love getting my money. The way I see it, we'll be doing the city a favor. Don't give me that crap, interrupted Zeke. Let's not sit around here and sound like hypocrites. What they're doing is no different than what we've been doing for years. Undermining the law for our gain. That's where you're wrong, Zeke. There's a huge difference between them and us. Our operations are to make this city a better place. Every coalition we've taken down has been run by bad people. So we've been upholding the law to its fullest extent. However, these 14th Precinct cops are lazy, selfish, greedy, 
perverted pigs that are a disgrace to the badge. This is a clear-cut case of either them or us. And you best believe it ain't gonna be us. Does anybody have a problem with that? The room was dead silent. John looked over at Zeke, waiting for his counterpoint. Zeke folded his arms and leaned back into his chair. Delighted cops were dedicated to the new plan their leader had conjured, ready and willing to do their part. Pleased to see the undying support by his team, John mumbled under his breath, This is too easy. Chapter 26 The 14th Precinct was camouflaged in dirt and graffiti, rivaling the other buildings for biggest eyesore in their run-down neighborhood. Although a two-lane street passed out front, cops purposely parked their squad cars at an angle blocking one lane of traffic. Two cops sat on the front steps taking a cigarette break like thugs at a bodega. They noticed a taxi cab in front of the grocery store across the street. The driver put on the hazard lights and hurried inside to get a snack. A minute later, he slammed his cupcake and bottle of juice on the floor in anger, seeing a bright orange pocket ticket planted on his windshield. This cruel form of entertainment was routine for these crooked cops in this dismal district. Rusty Pipes and Rocky Diamonds approached the precinct, dressed in normal police uniforms. The two officers paid Rudy no mind, but seeing Rocky strut her stuff up those steps had them continuously hissing at her like a Vegas stripper. Rocky looked back and smiled before entering the building. Besides moonlighting as midnight marauders for John Hart, Officers Rudy Trax and Raquel Simmons worked for the 32nd Precinct in Harlem. This array struck the precinct lobby. Phones rang off the hook while the receptionist was busy texting her boyfriend. Troubled residents flooded the waiting area while officers stood around chatting about last night's football game. A criminal nearly escaped custody only to trip over a coat rack while attempting to run out of the building. Rusty found the entire scene embarrassing. Back outside, John Hart was parked two blocks away, counting down the minutes on his watch. Behind him was a fleet of squad cars revving their engines like a drag race. How we looking, Zeke? John spoke into the walkie-talkie. No activity out front, said Zeke, who stationed himself on a rooftop across the street from the precinct. Rocky and Rust already inside. Good. Stand your ground and eliminate anyone who tries to escape. I want all these scumbags completely boxed in. Out. John then radioed Harvey Gaines, who was circling the vicinity in a whirlybird. How we looking? he asked. Ain't a damn thing going on, Harvey answered. These fools got no damn clue we coming. We gonna do this or what? It's a go, Harv. As the chopper headed for the precinct, John let his siren ring like an ambulance truck and shouted into the radio receiver. All units, move in! I repeat, move in! Spinning red and white lights flooded the streets like a gushing river as the army of squad cars charged toward the precinct. John bulldozed through the sidewalks and skiddied next to the front steps. These two cops wondered what was going on and were greeted with pistols shoved in their faces. Get down on the ground and put your hands behind your head, John ordered, while his army went ahead and raided the lobby. They took down any personnel they got their hands on. The 14th Precinct cops attempted to fight back, but they were outrageously outnumbered. 
within the vehicular swarm. A rusty green van pulled up on the side of the precinct with Channel 49 Action News drawn on the side of it. Three reporters, who looked like high school teenagers, ran out into the street with a microphone and a handheld camcorder. They've been covering the raid since it began. Harvey circled the whirly bird around the rooftop and yelled through the loudspeaker. This is state police! Stand down! I repeat, stand down! Just then, three cops ran out on the roof and opened fire. Stop! This is the police! You there! Stop! Freeze! Seeing the three cops ignoring his order, Harvey turned the copter around and armed the Gatling gun on its left side. Even though the cops had a change of heart and tossed their weapons aside to surrender, Harvey opened fire and shredded the cops into raw meat. Meanwhile, Rusty and Rocky ran to the back of the building and opened the emergency exit doors. More of John's officers rushed inside, carrying the duffel bags packed with Pagnucci's fortune. Stash all this stuff in any place you can find, said Rocky. And please use your brains for once by making this look believable. Yeah, added Rusty. Like, don't stick a bloody stock of bear bonds under somebody's desk, got that? Now move! Watching from the roof, Zeke felt miserable. People's lives and careers were being stolen from them because of one detective's greed for power. However, something else got his attention at that moment. A second floor window had opened. Was it a trapped civilian trying to escape? No, it was a cop. He jumped out the window and landed in the dumpster below. Zeke grabbed his rifle and patiently waited for him to climb out. After rumbling from beneath the garbage bags, the cop flipped out of the dumpster and crept through the alley. Zeke was ready to put him down. The cop's head was aimed dead center in the scope. As his finger touched the trigger, Zeke realized what he was about to do. Kill a fellow officer. Once he pulls that trigger, his badge will be nothing more than a paperweight. He couldn't do it. So he lowered his rifle and let the cop get away. Chapter 27 Late-breaking news reports exploded that afternoon on every major television network. Residents cheered like a Rose Bowl parade as John Hart threw his arms in the air and drank in the stupendous praise. Captain Randall was then escorted out to the street, handcuffed and ashamed. His eyes dripped with tears as he pleaded, I'm sorry! I should have done it! According to the Channel 49 news report, who broke the news a half hour ago on social media, 39 cops got arrested, all charged with murder, conspiracy to commit murder, grand larceny, and countless other acts of corruption. While being dragged into paddy wagons, the 14th Precinct cops yelled to the cameras that they were framed. Popular news anchor Trisha White was reporting live from the state police department looking for answers to these unimaginable accusations. John Hart stood proudly on top of the stairs and gave a brief statement to his millions of viewers about how his special operation had just begun. I was working undercover with the Pagnucci organization for four years, he opened. And daily, I remember being harassed by these traitors to the badge. I prayed to God that it wouldn't end this way. I hoped for these once fine officers to wise up and realize the importance of their oaths. But in the aftermath of Pagnucci's murder, I did not doubt whatsoever that it was Captain Randall who ordered the hit. 
So what you're saying is dozens of officers got arrested over a hunch? Trisha White pressed the detective. I didn't see that. In my mind, there was no doubt which group was responsible. However, I still conducted a thorough investigation, and thanks to a couple of key witnesses, I was able to gather enough evidence to link the 14th Precinct to this heinous crime and several other criminal acts that have accumulated over the years. I can't even begin to get into those right now. But how can you greenlight such a groundbreaking operation so soon? Have you been investigating the precinct from the start? If so, then for what reason? I have always had my suspicions on this gang, Miss White. Once I got confirmation that my assumptions were correct, the rest was easy. Luckily, my team was able to work with the mayor's office and his ingenious task force to quickly organize a tactical operation to apprehend these suspects before they had a chance to continue their wave of terror. Hold it right there, Mr. Hart. If these cops are guilty of such horrific crimes, then why did they return to work the next day knowing the consequences would be fatal to their careers if they got caught? Don't you think they would have gone somewhere far away and out of the public eye until the heat cooled down? If you paid attention to what you just said, Miss White, you'd realize that you just answered your own question. Being on the job was their cover. No mafia in the world would ever expect on being attacked by an army of dirty officers. Especially the same officers they've done so much business with. John rubbed the inner corners of his eyes and started to sniffle, acting as if the entire situation was too emotional to bear. Reporters were eating it up, becoming teary-eyed. Cameramen zoomed in on his face. His voice cracked. And now that the poison has been extracted, residents who've lived in that unsafe region for so many years can finally make their neighborhood a happier and safer place to live once again by rebuilding a working relationship with the police. I am eternally grateful that my team and I were able to contribute to the Lower East Side community and the welfare of our environment. Now, if you all excuse me, I have mountains of paperwork waiting for me in my office. Thank you for your time. Not satisfied with Hart's hokey soliloquy, Trisha White and her crew trotted up the stairs after him, demanding more proof and reason behind his miraculous investigation. Annoyed at the pestering reporter, John grabbed the first officer closest and whispered, Give it to this broad. A wall of navy uniforms blocked the entranceway. Trisha and her team were told to clear out, or else they'll be escorted off the block. Rounds of applause rang through the lobby as soon as John stepped through the doors. Handshakes and hugs handed out from numerous officers praising the success of his operation. John played along and acted modest, letting his co-workers know that he was just doing his job. Assistant Deputy Superintendent Holly Jacobs grabbed John by the hand and gazed at him with sultry eyes while requesting a private meeting in her office later on this evening. Smiling in appreciation was Saxon Davis, embracing John like a proud father with a grand hug, repeatedly shouting, My boy! My boy! John tapped the old man's back and gave him the fakest smile he could muster. Congratulations, son. This will go down as one of the greatest sting operations in the history of this department. Within half a decade, you've managed to accomplish near impossible tasks that the most brilliant and skillful officers couldn't come close to completing. It's not impossible anymore, sir, John joked. That's right, Saxon laughed. And now so many officers, even captains and commanders, present and future, can follow your outline of law enforcement brilliance for years to come. This is a great day for the people in our fair city, as well as a sad one. It breaks my heart to see our fellow brothers and sisters in blue fall victim to corruption, forgetting what the badge always stood for. 
I'm just grateful that you stopped this regime before they perform an attack on a larger scale. I'm proud of you, son. John was thinking, oh, brother. Bunny said, thank you, sir. If you have a moment, I'd like to talk to you in my office. John hoped for this discussion to end quickly as he walked into his boss's office. Saxon can be long-winded at times, treating their meetings more like father-son talks. John wasn't in the mood to listen to another one of his life lessons or boring anecdotes. He had business to take care of with his regime. Saxon sat on the couch rather than behind the desk and asked John to sit next to him. What was on the old man's mind besides the several seeds the conniving detective had planted there already? What I'm about to tell you is strictly confidential, said Saxon. These words do not leave this office, agreed? John nodded. I decided to retire. This is the best news I've heard all day. Surely you can't be serious. You have plenty of years ahead of you, sir. I, I mean, I, I just can't believe what I'm hearing. Johnny, I've given this a lot of thought. My decision became certain once I saw what you've done today. My weak old bones can't handle big operations like this anymore. I should have stepped down years ago after my wife passed on. Got that right, old fool. I guess my real concern was who would I leave in charge after I'm gone. The state police department is my family and I can't just let some politician call the shots. I needed someone who knows the streets and won't crack under pressure. And on this day, my search has come to an end, knowing I could retire now with peace of mind and a clear conscience because I'm handing over the reins to the greatest officer I ever had the privilege to see in action. Oh, this is too easy. What are you trying to say, sir? Johnny, as bright as you are, you mean to tell me that you can't read between the lines? I want to make you the new deputy superintendent. I want you to have my job. Me? No, 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 no. I, uh, this is too sudden. I don't think I'm ready for this. Leave your badge on the table and get the f*** out of my office. Besides, isn't Holly next in line for your position? Yes, technically, Holly's a great officer. But I'm afraid the guys won't take her seriously. You see how she looks. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna see more than that tonight. Besides, I could recommend anybody I want. Just as long as I can convince Teasley that I'm making the right call. The position of deputy superintendent demands respect from their officers. And we both know there's no chance that Holly can match up to your accomplishments. No officer comes close to having a record like yours, so those boys will stand at attention the moment you sniff your nose. So what do you say? Ecstatic that his plan was proceeding perfectly, John hammed up the moment with a dramatic five-minute pause. Finding it difficult to grasp the words of gratitude, quivering chin, sniffling nose, holding his head up while letting out an extended sigh. I can't believe how gullible this old fool is. I should make him strip to his underwear and tie a curtain around his neck. But finally, he gave Saxon Davis the obvious answer. It'll be an honor, sir. Chapter 28 At the epic center of New York City's dynamic creative industry in Hudson Square, another workday was coming to a close at the Department of Internal Affairs, a bureau dedicating to preserving the integrity and fighting corruption within the NYPD. However, Special Agent Martha Combs was still hard at work, researching two piles of folders on a desk, all stemming from the 14th Precinct Raid. 
The larger pile represented cops who'd been under investigation for years, while the smaller pile represented cops on the naughty list, but with reasonable causes, at least in the eyes of the working man. Her slender nose was just inches away from a stat sheet as she tucked a bunch of strands of her square bob hair behind her ears, wanting to record every listed number into her memory bank. Interrupting her intense concentration was the rattling sound of her desk telephone. Martha checked the number and saw it was her cousin, Natalie Mercedes, her former patrol partner in the NYPD and the only person she trusted with her life. Five years ago, on the nastiest streets of Brooklyn, Martha and Natalie opposed the most notorious criminals poisoning their community daily. Although teetering over the line of vigilantism several times, these strong black women never crossed over it, staying loyal to the badge and committed to fighting crime by the book. Due to the heavy corruption in their precinct, Martha became motivated to join internal affairs and clean up the system from the inside. But right before her examination, Natalie abruptly resigned. She wanted to move ahead with her plans to start a private investigation firm, but Martha refused. Once receiving word that a promotion to eternal affairs was granted, Martha found the opportunity too good to pass up. While her career took off to new heights, Martha's personal life had crashed and burned. She divorced her husband of 14 years, Samuel Folgers, and lost custody of their 13-year-old son, Henry Folgers, due to the demanding hours and dangers of her job. She was devastated. From that point on, the job and her cousin were the only two things that kept her from going insane. What's up, girl? Martha asked. Oh, same old, same old, said Natalie. House life in the world of tight suits, greasy palms, and racist cops. Stressful, annoying, and in a nutshell, pretty sad. But thank you, Jesus. How about you? How's it going in the hood of freelance justice? Still taking out the trash, making some loot here and there. Got a great staff working for me, so it's all good. I'm on the job right now, but I bet you'll never guess where. Martha thought for a minute, but came up empty. Connecticut? Are you serious? Martha giggled. As a damn heart attack. It was supposed to be an open and shut domestic violence case, but it turns out the scumbag moonlights as a drug runner for a crew in Hartford. I should take this fool to small claims court for gas and toll expenses, but that's after I bust his ass like he did to his woman. Martha laughed. Have him pay your fee instead. Oh, he's going to pay all right, believe that. Natalie laughed. What I ain't got you doing this time? Girl, it's been a rough couple of days. Fraud is becoming an epidemic with these departments, and it's getting contagious. You wouldn't believe the number of files I had on my desk, and they're all related to that damn raid in Lower Manhattan. I heard about that on the radio. Remember I used to tell how dirty the 14th Precinct was, but the whole damn precinct? Not even I saw that one coming. Do you think they were capable of pulling off such a horrific crime in such a short amount of time? That's what's puzzling me. Most of these cops have been on our radar for a while, but as I'm reading their jackets, I don't think any of them would have the balls to kill a crime boss. They're perverted losers who arrest prostitutes just to get some hands or some booty, or maybe they played us off for fools by acting lazier than usual. Even as I hear myself say it, it sounds too far-fetched. Don't you agree? Yeah, it seems too open and shut for me. Certainly right. Martha sighed. Where's the time gone, Nat? You remember when this job used to be fun? Like when you got excited to know that you'd be making a difference in somebody's life today? You still get that feeling? Not that much. On some days, it does feel like a job. Lousy clients or lame cases and such. But some people come to my office because they have nowhere else to turn to. To those people, I'm making a difference. That's when I get the goosebumps and feel proud of what I'm doing. Sounds so great. But it doesn't beat our days together, right? Oh no. I miss our days of chasing down drug dealers, breaking up rumbles, getting into shootouts and all of that. Both ladies laughed. I also miss happy hour. Us hanging out with Memphis and his wild bunch. 
Girl, those were the days. I ain't seen Memph in a minute. Or Naomi. Have you spoken to either one? Not in years. I don't even know if he's still a cop. I hope he is. We need more dedicated cops like him on the streets. I wish you were in the agency with me, Nat. We could have brought our double trouble act to the big time and taken down a lot of these kingpins in power. Part of me still regrets resigning the way I did, but I don't trust the system, Martha. If anything, I wish you came with me. But don't get me wrong. I'm thrilled at your continuous success with IA, but just imagine if an army of crooked cops decided to take the city under siege. Eh, maybe it's just paranoia. I'd say so, because that'll never happen, Nat. Cops usually break bad for selfish reasons, so there goes the chance of any army being formed. Only a conniving leader can organize a seize of corruption within the ranks, gathering and negotiating with many cops from separate divisions. Downright impossible. Now, didn't you just say fraud was becoming an epidemic? Martha paused. Cops have been more vigilant these past few years. Could it ironically be happening? Doubt entered her mind, taking the subject more serious than before. I gotta get back to work. She hurried. And for the record, I'm not mad at you for leaving. I love you, girl, and I always got your back. I know this already. Still great to hear, though. Once this madness is over, we gotta get up again. Like a girl's night out or something. How does that sound? You're on, sister. Hanging up the phone, Martha drilled her eyes back towards the staggering police files. Something didn't sit right as she reviewed John Hart's report submitted earlier via messenger. His evidence led a trail to the precinct, but how did he come to this conclusion in just a matter of hours? She grabbed an officer's file from the smaller pile, Officer Freddie McMurray. While examining his performance, McMurray got red flagged for suspicion of extortion. He spent most of his nights in Chinatown, strong-arming drug dealers for 10% of their profits. However, he was happily married for 20 years, fathered the two boys and one girl, and coached Little League Baseball on the weekends. His home life was stable, she discovered. Why would he go off the deep end all of a sudden? Murder and armed robbery. It doesn't make sense. She dug deeper into the smaller pile, grabbing a bunch of files at once. Much of these officers had similar backstories, committing wrongful actions with a moral purpose. None involved in criminal espionage. What did Detective Hart have on these guys that she wasn't seeing? She then grabbed ten folders from the larger pile and swam through the ocean of reports. These cops, on the other hand, were under investigation for harsher crimes, some involving mafia figureheads. Yet none was questioned for murder. She couldn't pinpoint a proper motive. What are you up to, John? She wondered. Martha searched for John Hart's profile in the Internal Affairs database, but her access got denied, deeming the file as classified. She used every technical procedure to go around the security blocks and got booted out each time. Visibly frustrated, she beelined and burst into the office of Inspector Judas Lee, who was at his desk gathering notes for a meeting. He was one of the top agents in the agency, working closely with Police Commissioner Wood to establish NYPD as the premier organization for public safety in the country. Martha Combs was his go-to agent, and Lee has given his directors enough confidence to put her in charge of a unit soon. Sir? Martha announced. I need access to John Hart's case files. Good afternoon to you, too, said Inspector Lee. Having a good day thus far? It'll be a whole lot better if I could get access to that file. You're a high-ranking agent, Combs. You can get them on your own. Oh, no. Don't tell me your computer's on the blink again. I swear I'm going to hang the IT department by their testicles if they don't get our systems fully operational by the end of the day. My computer's fine, and I should have access to every file recorded, but for some reason, I'm being denied access to this particular file. He's an officer of the state police. What's his name? Detective John Hart. Inspector Lee was appalled to hear his name. John Hart, he asked. The savior of our city? The golden boy? 
Lee chuckled like it was a joke, but the stone look on Martha's showed she was dead serious. He dropped his smile. You're not kidding. With all respect, why would I make jokes at a time like this? You're right. Sorry. No problem. Now can I get that file? Why would you not have access to it? Maybe it's under review by one of the directors. Maybe he's in line from promotion or something. Also, as I just mentioned, our systems have been screwy all day. Could be several reasons why you can't open it. Care to elaborate on your assumptions about him? She leaned over the inspector's desk. Isn't it odd for one cop to accuse an entire police precinct of wiping out probably the biggest crime syndicate this decade? I'm almost certain Pagnucci had them all on his payroll, but if that's so, then why go to war with him? On top of that, a large portion of those cops are either overweight or past their prime. Are they capable of orchestrating such a massacre of epic proportions? Lee leaned back in his chair and put his hands together. Murder is unexplainable, Combs. Otherwise, we wouldn't have jobs. What I do know about the 14th Precinct is that they monitor a highly corrupt district. I'm guessing they were so passionate about serving justice that they lost faith in the judicial system and took matters into their own hands. Sounds logical to me. Throughout the history of law enforcement, have you ever heard of a string of crime bosses being taken down by one detective who wasn't working with the FBI? What the damn federal government still has yet to accomplish! Sorry, Combs. Your theory does hold some merit, but I can't go over the department heads. If they're holding on to this file, then there has to be a good reason. And if they find some truth to what you're saying, I'll alert you immediately. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm heading to a meeting. Good day, Miss Combs. Yes, sir. Chapter 29 Martha slammed her office door in disappointment. She was determined to see those reports, pondering on how to get around the security block. Then an idea sprouted from something that Lee said. IT's been working on their systems. Khalil Reeves was her go-to technician in that department. Besides being clever with hacks and transponder codes, Khalil has had a crush on her for the last couple of years. Time to use the old damsel in distress routine. Hi, Mr. Reeves, she said in a sweet, flirty voice. Is your department running upgrades? Goodness, no, said Khalil. You would have been the first to know if we were. So, what do I owe the pleasure of your call? Having problems with your station? Well, um, you see, Lee gave me some new case files to review, but my software might be out of date. I can't seem to navigate through the database without it, asking me to enter my password all the time. Think you could take a look at it for me, please? For you? It'll be a pleasure. Khalil surfed through past maintenance schedules stored in the repair archives. Strange. Your upgrades were installed two weeks ago. New software is scheduled to be installed six months from now. You shouldn't be having any problems. Really? Then something else must be wrong. My password must not be working. Or was it changed without my consent? Every time I log in the system, it says access denied. Access denied. Access denied. Ugh! I'm so stressed, I don't know what to do. Please help me, Khalil. Hold on a second. The tech agent jumped into the security firewall and fixed her password to override security. All done. I unlocked your password, giving you access to the entire system. You should be good now, but just in case, I placed a repair ticket with one of my techs. If any other problems should surface, call me back and I'll take care of you. Your system, I mean. Oh, I see. Thank you so much, Khalil. Anytime. Martha typed in her password one more time. Access granted. Finally opening John Hart's file, she searched his arrest records. 
For four years, Hart was involved in undercover operations that resulted in imprisonment or banishment of several major drug cartels and crime families in the tri-state area. He must have been there the night Pagnucci died, she thought. John also kept a log of weekly reports sent to the state police. Not once did he mention an altercation between Pagnucci and the cops in the 14th precinct. He even noted that Pagnucci used all the cops on his payroll to transport drugs to the street dealers. If Pagnucci had a business arrangement with the 14th precinct, then why would they attack him? He never dealt with them. Some doesn't add up. Martha typed 14 in the search box and only one report popped up. It read that John had joined forces with the 14th Precinct to raid a stash house in Lower Manhattan three years ago. Plenty of arrests were made and large quantities of dope were retrieved. She then discovered one small detail probably overlooked. In his closing statement, Hart was recording and saying, None of the money had been recovered. She thought long and hard about this. Why didn't John use state police officers for the raid? And why was there a need to shut down a stash house if there was no money in it? He worked with the 14th Precinct before, but Pagnucci never met them. And yet, these same cops are being charged for his murder? Along with every past operation are orchestrated? Scapegoats? He did it, she gasped. And he's using the 14th Precinct cops to take a fall. Martha quickly downloaded the files and dragged them onto a memory stick plugged into the back of the computer. Hard copies were being printed at the same time. She stuffed all the items into an envelope and addressed it to Natalie, clipping a handwritten note onto the sheets before sealing the flap. She was then startled by the buzzing of her desk intercom. Never is she this jumpy, but uncovering a conspiracy would rattle the nerves of the toughest human being. She took a deep breath and pressed the receiver button. This is Combs. Hey, it's Lee. I just wanted to apologize for our conversation earlier. I didn't mean to shoot down your theory so dismissingly. I was just following protocol. Hope you can understand that. I will never dismiss anything you put in front of me. You know that. It's okay, sir. The directors have been antsy as of late. They've been stepping on eggshells since the spike in complaints about police corruption. They want to get to the bottom of it as much as you do. No need to apologize. Sometimes I can go a bit overboard with my assumptions. I shouldn't have put you in that predicament. Going over your superiors isn't something you need to do to prove my theories. I'm sorry, too. For what? That's how you earn your current position. You're a damn good agent, Combs. One of my best. I want you to know that I decided for both of us to talk to the directors about this John Hart file first thing tomorrow morning. I'm sure there's a reason why it's locked and we'll find out together. Sound good? Martha froze. She already found out what she was looking for. To not make any waves, she merely said, Thanks, Chief. What she's done had crossed the line. Breaking protocol. Lying and stealing is not what they do to obtain information. In this case, however, it was necessary. She then just had a terrible thought. Would the directors know if a file had been retrieved without authorization? Does the system keep a record of it? She may need Khalil to do another favor for her tomorrow. As for now, she decided to keep her mouth shut and get this package mailed, even if this action costs her job. If John is guilty, Natalie will certainly blow this case wide open and bring him to justice. Speaking of mailing, the mail room closes at 7 p.m. It's now 6.45 p.m. She had 15 minutes. Martha left a message on Natalie's voicemail, briefly explaining the package. She told her not to open it until she arrived. With the package tucked under her arm, Martha strolled toward the elevators. 
Riding down 19 floors in 10 minutes, it could feel like an eternity at this time of night with hundreds of employees leaving at the same time. The elevator arrived with only a few people inside. She sighed in relief. It should be a fast trip. A slight hiccup, however, as each person had a different floor pressed. Seven minutes to go and only one person left. She can make it. The elevator arrived on the 10th floor and suddenly a crowd of people crammed themselves inside, pressing every floor between 10 and 1. Damn it! Impatiently, Martha pushed her way out of the elevator and raced towards the closest staircase, running down and hopping over stairs like school kids in the hallway. She reached the lobby with a minute to spare, but the mailman was already loading his truck in front of the building. Wait! She hollered while running through the lobby. I have one more! The mailman stopped and jumped off the truck. Martha pushed through the front doors and held out the package. You have to deliver this package, she said, catching her breath. It came straight from the director's office, and he told me that this has to go out tonight. Can you please do me a favor and add this to your list? Has this been registered with the office? Asked the mailman. Look, most of those guys shut down their systems already and got their feet halfway out the door. Ain't none of them gonna want to stay longer to register another package. Let's just keep this between us for now, and I'll sign whatever needs signing tomorrow. First thing, I wouldn't be asking if it wasn't important. The mailman read the address and smiled. You're in luck, he said. Where this is going isn't too far from my home. I'll drop this off for you. Besides, seeing how fast you were running, I'd say it is important. You have no idea. I owe you one. Aw, shucks. Always willing to help a person in need. You have a very difficult job on your hands. It's about time somebody made it a little easier for you for once. Thank God. Thank God indeed, for this is his doing. I believe I was meant to see a discrepancy in my packaging catalog so that you would reach me in time. He works in mysterious ways. Heh, you believe in that stuff? Most definitely. Faith can be a very powerful weapon in your life. You just have to use it. I just think this meeting was an incredible case of luck. Either way, I'm grateful that it happened. Thank you, Mr. Good. Matthew Good, and don't worry, your package is in good hands. Chapter 30 Exiting the Garden State Parkway, Martha felt stress slide off her neck as another 15-minute drive separated her from slipping into a pair of silk pajamas and cuddling up in front of the television with a gallon of ice cream. Her two-level house stood high within the hilltop community of Gravesend. Hiking boots would be needed whoever dared to walk from the entrance gates to her front door. A good workout, to say the least. Sleepiness entered the picture as she stopped at a red light on Cavalier Avenue. Taking a nap sounded like a good idea before calling Natalie about the top-secret package. After a day like today, she needed a moment to recharge her batteries before completely burning out. However, thoughts swam through her mind about the agency. Did the mailman tell the truth? What if another agent saw her? Will Inspector Lee find out? Agent Combs was swimming in dangerous waters without a life preserver. Never has she broke protocol before. But part of her job is preventing police corruption. Wrongly convicted lives are at stake. She had no choice. Lee. Mentioning his name rattled her nerves, remembering their conversation. Only a high-ranking agent could lock and unlock whatever files they choose. Then it dawned on her. Why couldn't Lee unlock the file himself? He didn't want to step on the toes of his superiors. Why would that be the case if Hart is such a good cop? Why is he so persistent, timid? Martha's eyes widened, instantly waking up from her sleepy gaze. I'll be damned, she thought. 
Hilate. Just then, a Harley Davidson came upon her left side. Disturbed by the revving engine, Martha glanced over at the rider. A brawny female wearing a high-waist leather jacket and matching pants sat behind the handlebars. Coils of platinum blonde hair hung from the bottom of her black helmet. The light turned green and Martha drove forward while the biker, to a relief, turned left. Nerves must be getting the better of her again. She decided to call Natalie now. Coming to another red light, she pulled out her cell and paused. Reception bars were all down. She must be in a dead zone. Strange. Every house around her had a satellite dish. Telephone poles on every corner. How can she not have a signal? Maybe her phone is out of whack. I need a new damn phone, she said before tossing it on the passenger seat. Suddenly, roaring its engine louder than before, the Harley had returned. Same biker. Am I being followed? She thought foolishly. New Jersey neighborhoods can have confusing roads. Perhaps the biker made a wrong turn. This damn package has got me paranoid. But then, the biker inched a bit closer, rolling next to Martha's window and repeatedly revving the cycle engine. It sounded like an angry lion hunting for meat. Martha didn't want to turn around, quaking in fear for the first time today. She knew her question had been answered. Somebody found out what she did. Her hand slid across the armrest where her thirty-eight special was kept. Slowly, she turned to her left. Gasp! The biker was facing her direction. Lifting the helm advisor, multicolored, haunting, dead eyes stared a hole through her soul. Before the light turned green, Martha slammed on the gas and zoomed down the street, swerving around every passing corner at top speed. No matter what colors flashed on the street lights or who was crossing the street, she feared for her life. Get home. Call Natalie. Screeching to a stop into an intersection, Martha opened the door and pulled out her thirty-eight, waiting for the biker to come. Short breaths pumped from her lungs as her eyes shifted down the empty streets. Except for squeaks coming from the dangling traffic light, it was pin-drop quiet. Martha lowered her weapon and sighed in disbelief. She grabbed her walkie-talkie from the glove compartment and radioed the department switchboard. Only static buzzed from the receiver. No reception again. Damn it! She yelled before throwing the device in the back seat. The neighborhood looked deserted, seeing nothing but run-down projects. The numerous wild turns must have lured her off course to an unknown side of town. No signs of oncoming traffic whatsoever. Not one person crossed the street. Shops closed. None of her communication devices worked. She was alone. From out of nowhere, a faint buzzing sound broke through the silent streets. Martha panicked as she slammed on the gas pedal and rocketed down the street. Just then, the biker came charging after her, firing an Uzi 9mm. The car got nicked by bullets as she cut through the narrowest of alleyways. The biker stayed nipping at her heels. How could she get out of this ghost town? Where was the highway? She lost all sense of direction. Was there enough gas to keep this chase up? This madness has to stop. Once exiting the alleyway, Martha swerved onto a ground of a run-down candy factory. A polluted river flowed on its right side, and her eyes gawked a long stretch of road ahead. Seeing the biker at close range, Martha slammed the brakes and drifted the car down the road. While spinning into half a donut, she switched gears to reverse and began driving backward. She stuck her gun out the window and tightly pressed on the trigger, firing relentlessly. Bullets flew past the biker like flies in the peppermint field. The biker retaliated by spattering bullet holes across the windshield. Martha suddenly hit the brake and shot at the motorcycle's tires. Air exploded from underneath and the bike flew several feet ahead. 
her motorcycle violently tumbled down the road like a cell phone in the dryer. She nosedived into a bed of rocks and got carried off by the dirty water, lifelessly floating downriver. Martha exited the car and crept toward the wreckage. Moving past the smoking Harley and banged-up helmet, she breathed a long sigh of relief. But no time to reflect on escaping death. She rummaged through the biker's belongings, and all she found was a flip phone with duct tape over the mouthpiece. Definitely an assassin, she thought. Checking the call history, her temperature had risen once she discovered the last incoming call number, Khalil Reeves. Not knowing if hours or minutes had passed, Martha aimlessly cruised through the desolate city and relied on landmarks she drove past earlier to lead her back to the highway. Suddenly, the reception bars on her phone sprung up like flowers. She wasted no time calling Natalie again. The number you were trying to call is not in service, the operator announced. Damn it! She yelled, throwing her cell against the dashboard. Stupid piece of sh**! Smartphone my ass! She ate every red light on the street, more anxious than ever to get home. She then came to a stop as she saw flashing red lights up ahead at a railroad crossing. Gates came down as the freight train chugged on by. Home awaited on the other side. She can see the setting sun shining from behind the hills of her community. Figuring it'll be a few minutes before she can move, Martha took the time to lay her head back and relax and let the mounting stress dissolve to nothing. Impatient honks from a blasting horn broke her out of the comforting state. Even in the peaceful moment, she can't relax. Annoyingly, she turned around. Her life flashed before her eyes. It was the biker! As Martha attempted to drive through the gates, a brigade of bullets tore through her car. Blood splattered across the windshield. Martha could no longer control the wheel as her grip became weak. Her car broke through the gates and rolled onto the tracks. Seconds later, another oncoming freight train collided into the vehicle, dragging it for about a mile before the conductor could bring the train to a stop. The biker rode her newly forged motorcycle along the gravel. Her helmet was fully intact. Leather clothing as sleek and shiny as ever. How on earth did this happen? Who is this devious biker? The conductor jumped from the train and ran toward the damaged car. Several bullets were then planted in his back, killing him before his body hit the ground. She stepped over his corpse and loaded another magazine into her Uzi. That's when she spotted a battered Martha Combs desperately climbing out of a broken car window. Bloodied and scarred, the gallant agent crawled along the gravel as hard as she could, dragging her dead legs along, barely enough strength to breathe. Trails of blood slid along the rocks, and yet... She refused to die. The biker strutted toward her helpless victim. She took off her helmet and tossed it to the side. Curly blonde hair draped over her face. She stepped in front of Martha's path, waiting for her to crawl closer. She then yanked Martha by the back of her hair until they were face to face. Martha trembled at the sight of her hideous face. Pasty white skin, a mole near her nose, clear lip gloss, heavy pink rouge on the cheeks, and two different colored eyes. Her wicked smirk showed a hint of her corroded yellow teeth. She heard no sirens ring, no yells for help. As Martha fell face first into the gravel, all she heard was the sound of the Uzi click behind her head. Natalie, she whispered. She never got to say goodbye. The biker squeezed the trigger until emptiness clicked from the automatic weapon. She then lit up a cigarette and strutted back to her bike. 
The tires swerved against the gravel as she rode off into the sunset. Her identity could only be viewed by the words pressed on the license plate. Cat Strutter. Chapter 31 In the wee hours of the night, John Hart gazed out from the window of his oversized but luxurious private office at Club Candy Cane. Seeing the line of people waiting to get inside curving around the block, John guffawed at the thought of how much money he'll be making tonight. Rocky Diamond strutted in wearing a red leather suit and matching stiletto boots. In her hands were a briefcase and a black storage tube. She sat on the edge of John's desk and placed both items right in front of his chair. He wasted no time rushing over to open them, sucking in the drool from his teeth. A set of blueprints slid out from the tube entitled Federal Reserve Bank. We got the place picked out, he announced while unraveling the blueprints across his glossy oak table. Phase one is complete. To get started on phase two, I need you to alter the tracking devices on our vehicles. We have to let those idiots behind the desk think we're being good little boys and girls while patrolling these godforsaken streets, get me? No doubt, baby, said Rocky. She hopped into his office chair and rolled it over to the computer table. Opening the notepad app on the cell phone, she swiped over to a saved document that listed a bunch of codes that she copied some time ago. Hacking into the Eternal Affairs database, she switched their GPS vehicle frequencies with normal patrol units from different precincts. So, now John can cause whatever melee he wishes, but the GPS will show him either patrolling a park or involved in a high-speed chase completely invisible. Breaking through the mood was the buzzing sound of the intercom. John checked the security feed on his table monitor, wondering who would be dumb enough to show up unannounced. He rolled his eyes and let out a sigh of annoyance after seeing who was patiently waiting by the back entrance. Khalil Reeves. He told Rocky to wait in the conference room as he buzzed Khalil inside the club. Rocky rolled up the blueprints and stuffed them back inside the tube. She strutted out of the office just as Khalil approached from the hallway. She threw him a seductive glance, but the crooked agent failed to catch it. As Khalil entered the office, John poured out two shots of whiskey. Surprise you came by, he said. Let it be known that I am grateful for all the hard work you've done for the movement. You've become a vital member of my team. But unless I tell you so, don't ever come to my office unannounced again. I don't like unnecessary attention being drawn to my place of business, Reeves. Just remember that if something bad happens to me, then something bad is going to happen to you. Get the point? I appreciate you being a stickler to authority, Khalil disdained. However, let me straighten you out about a few things. Nobody tells me to do anything. Just because I volunteered to help your organization doesn't mean that I'm your lackey. I do what I believe is necessary to further our cause, slaughtering the lambs of our society to put us in the higher position of power, nothing more. Do you get the point? Noted, John smirked, letting Khalil's disrespectful attitude slide. Want a drink? No, thank you. Then please, have a seat. John picked up his glass full of whiskey while motioning toward an empty chair for Khalil to sit. I'll stand. Fine. John took a seat and kicked his feet up on the desk. Suddenly, he sprung back up as if a fresh thought had just sprouted in his mind. Come to think of it, I'm glad you came by, he said. Something's been bothering me about your last task. And now that you're here, we can talk about it face to face. What problems do you wish to discuss? John stood up and walked around to the front of the desk. He sat on the edge while downing the whiskey from his glass. Members of my team have only killed people when needed. 
the old hook em and book em routine doesn't work anymore. But how does offing an IA agent seem beneficial to our cause, especially since I wasn't involved with the planning of it? Can you explain that to me, Mr. Reeves? Combs had to be terminated because she was about to expose you to City Hall. She asked me to hack into your files, after I've had them locked to protect your scrawny behind. I guess she knew your operations were a sham, and it was only a matter of time before those imbeciles at City Hall would have listened. Our cause would have been destroyed. Again, I applaud you for your loyalty. Thank you for finding it in your good graces to protect me. With that being said, who the hell authorized you to use Strutter to do your dirty work? She is my secret weapon. Why couldn't you take that nosy broad out yourself? Was your heart on for her so enraged that you just couldn't bring it upon yourself to blow her brains out? Lucky for you. Jersey cops are too dumb to trace this back to us, or else we would have had a serious problem. Well, a problem may exist. Before I ordered a hit, I broke into Martha's office for evidence that may lead back to you. There was one page left on the printer. An invoice. She must have printed your history as insurance. What's baffling me is what the hell did she do with it? John shook his head. Give me one good reason why I shouldn't throw you out of this window right now. Let me finish. She has a cousin who used to be a cop. I'm guessing she might have called her for help to dig up more dirt on you. Her name is Natalie Mercedes. I suppose you can tell me where to find this broad. That's your job, Johnny. My job is only to watch crooked cops like you. Having had enough of Khalil's pompous attitude, John yanked him by his tie and dragged him over the table. You might be an internal affairs stooge, but make no mistake, this is my aquarium. And you're just a guppy that I'm allowing to swim in it. I'm the great white shark. I will not hesitate to chop you up into pieces of mince meat. Not for a second. So, if you don't live up to my expectations, then I will cut your nuts off and shove them down your stinking throat. Sass me again, and I'll prove that to you. Khalil's arrogance dispersed as he nodded in between gasps for air. Just then, John's cell phone vibrated from his table. He pushed Khalil back into the chair and ordered him to have a drink. As John left the office to answer his call, Khalil quickly grabbed the bottle and let trails of whiskey dribble from the sides of his mouth as he took a long swig. Who's this? John answered as he stepped into the hallway. Get to the nearest television and turn on the news, said Grandpa. John hurried into the conference room and snapped at Rocky to hand him the remote. He flipped a red light switch on the wall and it began to split open. Mounted behind it was a 90-inch plasma flat-screen television. He tuned into Channel 4 and saw a late-breaking story in progress. Following up on the 14th Precinct Siege, reported by none other than Trisha White. Former police captain Carl Randall has come forth stating he wants to make a plea deal in exchange for recorded conversations that implicate state police detective John Hart being involved in a series of heists and assassination plots, including the death of Crispin Pagnucci. Here's the statement Randall made to the media earlier today. Hart did this to me. Hart did this to my department. He didn't want to go down with his ship, and I can't blame him for that. But I got that son of a bitch on tape conversing with me about several ways to take over this wonderful city that's been my home all my life. If City Hall and the FBI want to cut a deal, I can make these recordings available to them in 24 hours, but only on the grounds that I'm granted full immunity on all charges. Rocky stared at the screen with razor-thin green eyes while John roared with frustration. He got back on the phone and said, I don't understand what went wrong. Randall has the IQ of a brick. I use the same amount of power on him as I usually use on Davis, so there's no way my spell should have been broken by that idiot. 
Who the hell does he think he is trying to frame me? I can't explain it, Grandpa. Just slow down a minute, Johnny, Grandpa retorted. You should be glad that this happened. Hiccups always separate the men from the boys. However, had you been taking care of your powers, as I told you, then he would have been frying in the electric chair before realizing why he was there in the first place. What's disappointing me mostly is how much of a baby you sound like right now. What? Use your damn brain, boy. Don't you know a bluff when you hear one? You're a damn cop, right? He's bluffing! Randall knows his services are no longer required, and he's looking to drag you down to hell with him! Right, John realized. If he had taped our conversations, then he would have used this as a leverage a long time ago. He mentioned Pagnucci like I haven't murdered every kingpin and crime syndicate within the Tri-State area. Exactly. We got to shut him up before nosy people like Trisha White start sniffing up your trail and watch every move you make. She can stir up controversy within City Hall, and that scumbag of a mayor will put more pressure on you just to save his face. That can happen. What do you think I should do? Get rid of your footstools. What else? The whole damn department? I can't do that now. I need every member of my crew ready for our next operation. On top of that, if we were to have all of the 14th Precinct cops eradicated, then the first thing the media will speculate on is Randall's allegations against me. Everyone will assume I had something to do with it. You're right about that. I'll tell you what. For one time only, I'll get involved in this episode. By the morning sun, not one soul on this planet will ever know of Randall's existence. Trust me on that. Still, he needs to be taught a lesson about the price of disloyalty. Can you at least handle that part on your own? Yes, I can. A sinister grin stretched across his face. I have the best assassin working for me. Martha Combs found that out the hard way. Good. Set it up and call me when it's done. Chapter 32 Later that night at Rikers Island, after countless hours of negotiations, Carl Randall was escorted to the far left wing of the prison, a special section where convicted cops were kept. Bright lights surrounded the corridor, shining off the white walls and long steel bars. A bolted door guarded the wing, mechanically controlled by the nearby security station. Walking back to his cell, Randall passed a parade of flying spit and idle threats that came from his former officers who felt betrayed. He was a broken man. Even if granted freedom, he would never live freely again. Breaking the law was bad enough, but he crossed the line by partnering with John's underground network. He saw the fortune without looking at the price he had to pay to get it. The consequences of his groundbreaking confession sealed his fate. By this time tomorrow, all of New York City would know that his claim of evidence against John Hart was a sham. Dwelling in his lonely cell, suffocated by constant banter, Randall feared that Hart would respond within the next few hours. Minutes. Seconds. Either way, the show was over. Suddenly, the light shut off. Murkiness swallowed the entire wing. Like frightened children in the dark, the imprisoned cops yelled for the cops to turn the lights back on. Everyone panicked except for Randall, who got the message loud and clear. This was the response. A flash of light burst at the end of the hall, swaying back and forth and traveling along the walls. Obscenities erupted into raging threats as the officers rattled on their prison bars, unable to get out. The sound of a machete scraping along the steel brought the wing to a thunder silence. Light laggardly moved along the curves of a muscular female dressed in the prison guard uniform. Her pasty face radiated in the dark like a glow stick. The cop shrieked at the sight of pure evil. Cat Strutter had arrived.
One officer distressingly yelled, Somebody call the police! In unison, the cell door swung open. Cops instantly groveled on their knees, pleading for their lives to be spared. Randall walked from out the crowd and stared at Cat's evil presence with tearful eyes. He willingly dropped to his knees, ready to accept his bloody fate. The blonde menace stood over him, dangling her deadly machete above his head. He closed his eyes and gulped one last time. Then his blood splashed against the walls after his head got separated from his body with one slice. Like a hungry wolf, Cat attacked the rest of the cops, butchering them like cows in a slaughterhouse. Echoing howls were muffled during the sounds of flesh being sliced open like cold cuts and fluid splashing all over, all around the corridor. After several gruesome minutes of inhumane butchery, the screams faded to gasps until nothing sounded at all. Seconds later, rows of light flickered down the corridor, shining brightly once again. But strangely, the wing door remained locked. It never opened. Burgundy spatters stained the white walls. Mutilated officers floated in a thick pool of blood and gore that ran across the glossy floor. Randall and the 14th Precinct were no longer an issue. Cat Strutter had vanished, and John Hart's hands were totally clean. One, two, one, two. What the hell happened here? Unbelievable with the fucking noise, bro. Unbelievable with the fing noise. Lying and stealing is not what they damn it. Shut the f up. Rocky, Rusty, Harvey, and Zeke. Shut the f Chapter twenty F you. Unbelievable. I believe I was meant to see a discrepancy in my packaging catalog. Oh, I hate this shit.